Welcome back to the Lubbers Hole. It's great to have you with us. You're with Ian. And with Mike. As we read and talk and discover our way through the Aubrey Matron novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, where in this voyage were we last week? Where might this voyage take us this week? Oh, thanks, Ian. We had just finished crossing the line, had pulled down reverse of the metal and started on chapter one last week. So we opened in Barbados with the West Indies Squadron. Jack met his natural son, Sam Panda there, who we might say was the black spitting image of Jack. And Sam had just come from visiting Sophie, where he was trying to find Jack in England Stephen, as they pulled into Barbados, was being sought after by the flag surgeon or the, the squadron surgeon, the, uh, Mr. Waters, who had an illness he wanted to consult Stephen on. And Admiral's secretary, Mr. Stone, was also seeking uh, Stephen's attention. He you know, does a little bit of junior intelligence and was kind of hoping to move up in intelligence circles. So we heard last time that there was a court-martial coming up. This time, Jack will be sitting on that court-martial, all of the Hermione's that the British deserters on the Norfolk are going to trial. Stephen will attend to the surgeon Waters um, with the help of Butcher, the American surgeon, and will say goodbye to all the Americans from the Norfolk as they head o- home on parole. And it sounds like as we get to the end of the chapter, there just may be a new chase in view. A new chase. There must be not a moment to lose, but nobody said that yet, have they? Oh, I I think we might get there. We might get there. (laughs) I think I didn't write it up in the episode, but I believe Jack may have rung that tone with the Admiral. Well spotted. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. Well, there's a little bit of symmetry here. We opened the book. We opened chapter one with observers ashore watching Jack and the crew of the Surprise towing their, their prize into Barbados, into Bridgetown. We start chapter two with Stephen and Jack at anchor watching Sam's Portuguese caravel, Nossa Senhora Necessidades, I hope I'm saying that something like right, Our Lady of Needs, this what is called a very old-fashioned square stern vessel, this caravel heading out with Sam aboard. And Mike, I think we learned that a caravel is an ancient, very ancient ship design associated with the Portuguese, associated with all the voyages of discovery, especially Christopher Columbus, If I remember rightly, the Pinta and the Nina were caravels and the Santa Maria was a bigger ship. Right, right. Caravels were this very ancient kind of 15th, 16th century era design, a very square stern, often with Latin sails, and were the basis for lots of ship design all the way through into the uh, 18th century. So this is a very ancient design of ship. And I think we are clearly shown that this is a very ancient example of its type. Sam's ship is not having any of the luck that Columbus had. It's being sailed very badly, tacking backwards and forwards in the wrong direction. It's brought by the lee, and right by Needham's point, it's laid over on its beam ends by a gust of wind. Now, interestingly, Mike, Needham's point, that's exactly the spot where Jack had flexed his bit of club-hauling manoeuvre seamanship skills in the first chapter. But this time, the skipper of this Portuguese caravel with Sam Panda aboard is not having the same kind of look. Stephen and Jack are hollering. They've made some great mistake. If they would only let go of some rope or other, then everything could be saved. They're shouting because they can see Sam himself pulling on a rope. He's pulling on the long rope. It looks like Sam's ship is going to founder, but at the last moment, somebody lets go of the correct rope and the ship is righted again. And we all breathe this sigh of relief as this caravel sails on her way. Thank God, said Jack. Now they will not have to rise sheet or tack until they reach Para. They may even arrive without the loss of a soul. Lord Stephen, I've never seen such a piece of seamanship, nor such an example of divine intervention. That horrible old tub should never have reached Bridgetown in the first place, and she would certainly have founded with all hands just now, but for the grace of God. Only an uninterrupted series of miracles kind of kept her afloat these last 60 or 70 years. Yet even so, I could wish he had sailed in something that did not call for guardian angels working double tides, watch and watch. And by the way, this this is Jack in, invoking faith and angels and providence <laughs> a lot more than he normally does. I wonder if he's had an encounter recently with a man of God that he has a lot of respect for. Exactly. <laughs> oh, 
I think Stephen's got this amused detachment all the way through this exchange. He, he makes this nice observation. He says, he is a fine young man. And Jack replies, ain't he? How I hope young George will be such another. Ah, oh, I might, I, I really enjoyed reading this coming from Jack. And I, and I know the, the revelation and the introduction of Sam to Jack had gone so well. And it was so, you know, emotionally positive. I was starting this chapter still a little bit worried that Jack might be a bit reserved or a bit cautious about having an illegitimate black son in Africa. But this very, very sincere, I hope that my European white born in wedlock son, George, I hope that George will be just the same. That's a really, really great thing for Jack to say about Sam. It really is. It's fabulous. Thing. And, and like you, you know, I was like, when have I ever heard Jack sort of this, you know, kind of channeling the almighty so much and divine intervention and guardian angels working, you know, several double watches and double tides. And it was just great. Oh, well, they are just sort of basking in Sam and what a great guy he is. Jack's so excited about how he got to listen to Stephen and Sam going back and forth in Latin. And Jack points out that Parson Martin didn't seem to be quite as into the conversation. And, and Stephen pointed out that's because Martin uses the English pronunciation of the Latin. And Jack's like, well, what's wrong with that? And Stephen says, well, nothing other than the fact that only the English use it. And, <laughs> and so there was, there was this great little kind of dig. And, and you sort of see this thing, and we'll see it over and over again, about how Jack kind of thinks how the world functions best. And, and it's yeah. like, you know, the English pronunciation, the Latin, that, that, that should be the way it works for everything. But, but even with Jack, you know, kind of with this shine, this pride about his son, he then steps in here and wishes that Sam wasn't black. You know, he says, with all this great stuff, I just wish he wasn't. But Stephen sets him to rights here. He says, there's nothing wrong with being black, brother. The Queen of Sheba was black and a fine, shining black, too, I'm sure. Mm. Casper, one of the three kings, was black. St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, was an African. And he, too, had a son born out of wedlock, as you no doubt will recall. Furthermore, says Stephen, once you're accustomed to black skins, yellowish white bodies seem unformed and indeed repulsive, as I remember very well in the Great South Sea. So Stephen's thinking about when they were all browned and going, yeah, you know, we, we look a lot better here. And Jack says, well, I, I do wish, and forgive me, Stephen, that he were not a Roman. And I do not mean this as a fling at you, you know, Jack, you know, <laughs> put in mouth again with Catholics. I do not mean it from the religious point of view. Mm, okay, interesting. Oh, no, says Jack, it's not at all impossible that he should be saved. So here we have Jack, angels tied and tied. Now Jack, the theologian, uh, you can be Catholic and be <laughs> saved. But a fascinating revelation here. No, says Jack, I mean it because of the feelings against them in England. You remember the Gordon riots and all the tales about the Jesuits being behind the king's madness and many other things. By the way, Stephen, those fathers were not Jesuits, I suppose. I did not like to ask straight out. And, and so here, here you know, you know as, as concerned as Jack is, on the one hand, I'm thrilled that we now hear a little bit more about Jack, and he's kind of had a little bit of this anti-Catholic sentiment. But now we're knowing this is not faith-based. This is because of the prejudice at his time in England. And, and so I was glad to hear that. But we also have this Jack who really wants so much good, but still is reserved as, you know, he and Stephen are sometimes, well, you know, I never resort to personal questions here. You know, more <laughs> fascinating stuff about uh, the times and O'Brien writing about the times, but also O'Brien pointing out how we are such funny creatures <laughs> in our ways and habits. Yeah, we are. And it's nice of O'Brien to finally, finally give Jack Aubrey a decent sounding explanation for his prejudice against Catholics, which only really comes along when it turns out that a member of his own immediate biological family is a Catholic. Right. Hey ho. So Stephen is able to give Jack some reassurance that he thinks the fathers that Sam is traveling with are not Jesuits, although he predicts that they're going to make a comeback with their schools. He says they're turning out atheists by the score. And Stephen's got this very dry, sarcastic um, tone about the whole thing. He's very amused by this connection between Stephen and Jack, and he's very amused by Jack's contortions that he's putting himself through to try and be positive about Sam and also 
rationalize that with what he already thought um, about about the Catholics. O'Brien takes us to the real reasoning, I think, behind Jack's thinking about Sam's ethnicity and his faith. What I really mean is, he says, if he had been white and a Protestant, he might have been an admiral. He might have hoisted his flag. A fellow with his parts, quick, cheerful, lively, resourceful, modest and good company, was all cut out to be a sailor. Given the least chance, he could have distinguished himself. In a bloody war and a sickly season, he could not have missed a promotion. He might have ended wearing the Union flag at the main top gallant, an admiral of the fleet. Th- this is more than Jack hopes for for himself, really. Right. Or at least that's more than he's ever been able to say out loud right. about his own hopes for himself. And may- maybe there's a nice thing in there about how parents hope for more than they ever dared hope for themselves, for their children. That's a really nice moment. Right. But I think it's also funny to me that Jack is out loud saying, if only my son weren't black and a Catholic. But I think he's also saying, you know, if only the rest of the world were like my idealized view of the Royal Navy, then everything would be okay. Because then the one and only obvious thing for a talented person to do would be to join the Navy and become an admiral. And and it, it goes a long way to explaining what happens in so many of these books. Jack in the Royal Navy, Jack on a ship, Jack in action. Phenomenal. Jack ashore in the rest of the world that doesn't operate that way. Oh my God, what a mess. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, and Jack sees cause and effect there very differently than we do. (laughs) So Stephen provides kind of a contrasting worldview to Jack's naval view. Stephen says, but being black and a Catholic, he may also become an African bishop like St. Augustine, wear a mitre and carry a crook. Indeed, he may even become the Bishop of Rome, the sovereign pontiff, and don the triple tiara. And then again, Jack, you are to consider that in being a papisher, he's only following the example of all his English ancestors from the time Irish missionaries taught them their letters and the difference between (laughs) right and wrong. (laughs) Here we go, Stephen. Oh, Up until the days of Henry VIII of glorious memory, only a few generations ago. And O'Brien says, Jack did not seem altogether satisfied. So I love this, you know, Stephen kind of taking a little bit of air out of Jack's English balloon, them going back and forth a little bit. This is great fun here. (laughs) And Jack still can't kind of get out of this conversation without further barbs from Stephen. Right has to go over to the court martial Stephen has a patient to see so they're about to part ways and Jack adds but I am glad to hear what you tell me about your saint however and Stephen goes no 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 he's your saint too you know Saint Augustine is acknowledged by even the most recent sects by which he means the church of right <laughs> a, a recent sect yeah uh, he is after all one of the fathers of the church why so much the better says Jack if a saint and a father of the church can have an irregular connection why that is a comfort to a man. And Stephen's right there. He says, so it is too. Although I believe he was not a practicing saint at the time. Excellent joke. So poor, poor old Jack, I think he knows that Stephen's bested him here. Jack walked on in silence, it says, and then said, there was one thing I had wanted to ask Sam, but somehow I could not get it out. Somehow I could not say, Sam, did you mention your reason for wishing to see me at Ashgrove Cottage? And now we're past needing Stephen as a roasting partner. Now we need Stephen's intuition and insight, especially about Sophie. He did not, said Stephen. I am as certain as though I had been there. He is a dear, open, candid young man, but he is no fool, no fool at all. And he would never so trouble. Yet even so, says Jack, I'm afraid Sophie must have smoked it looking at his face, black though it is, bless him. You did so right away, or you would never have told me not to be dismayed. There is a very striking resemblance, it must be confessed, says Stephen. Do you think it would answer, was one to mention St. Augustine, to Sophie? She is a great one for the church. She is much opposed to irregularities of this kind, you know. She could hardly be brought to love. And here, guardian angels stepped in again, says O'Brien. One with a gag for the name Diana had formed in his gullet. So he was about to say irregularities like Diana's. Mm -hmm. But Diana, Sophie's cousin and Stephen's wife, had been very irregular indeed on occasion. And the other angel, this is the other guardian angel in Jack's brain, stepped in with an inspiration so that almost without a pause, he went on, could hardly be brought to love Henage Dundas 
because of his tribe of little bastards, until I told her he had saved me from a watery grave when we were boys. Mm, sure, it could do no harm, said Stephen. <laughs> wow. I love it. O'Brien writing this, you know, we're such a product of our worldviews. You know, Jack C. Sam yeah. through the naval career. And all, all of these individuals, primary characters, secondary characters, they're all fully formed human beings. They're, and they're all shades. You know, here, here we're talking about black and white, but in fact, nobody in these novels is black or white. We are all... No shades and colors and everything were never one dimensional always growing and changing but just just a little bit and in ways over time so and so often happens for me and this is one of those points in reading that i i love inhabiting this world that o'brien's created but it also causes me to pause and kind of examine my own world my own beliefs yeah, i look yeah. back over my journals my prejudices <laughs> my particular friends, you know, they, you know, I love the way that Jack and Stephen are supporting each other here. And Stephen saying, oh yeah, we could, we could mention St. Augustine. And, and then that guardian angel, you know, <laughs> instead of saying Diana and substituting an image. Um, it's just amazing to me here. And, and I think that there's not just a guardian angel working here on the ship and on Jack, but a little bit of maturity, a little bit more self-awareness yeah. for Jack and a little more love for Stephen and not wanting to tread on this sensitive topic of Diana, especially as he now has a very sensitive topic around Sophie. So it's, it's amazing here. I just, I love this. It's fantastic, isn't it? And as I was sort of looking at this passage and, and, and thinking about it and thinking about, you know, what it means for the characters, I'm realizing that actually it's a feature of the very, very best books. I think yes. all of the books in the canon are excellent. But I think the best ones are the, are the ones that dig into this aspect of a character's worldview and what they see about themselves and how they see themselves next to others. And for all, you know, it doesn't take us deep into the action. Yeah, Ian, just as you're saying, this is it's it's such a great part of O'Brien's writing. It's such a great part of, of the best books here. I, I think I'm starting to become accustomed to saying, we've talked sometimes, when's the story going to start? And sometimes yeah. the traditional kind of story starts in chapter nine out of 10. But, and it's not like immediate action from A to B to C and an occasional twist. It's not like a Marvel movie. It's just life. And it's fascinating and it's engaging. And, and we keep piling up these checkoffs and foreshadowing and great reminders of, of what's gone on in the past and who these people are. So it's, it's just fabulous. Maybe we get some semblance of the story picking itself up here. Jack and Stephen get ready to head to the flagship in Surprise's new barge. Um, lots of things are new, uh, new or looking well polished. Jack has his best uniform on. He has his Lloyd's sword. He had his Nile medal, the Chilenk. The boat's crew are all really nicely turned out. They've got their, they, they've beautified themselves without being told to. They've got their uniforms, their Senate hats. Each of them had a three foot ribbon on their hat embroidered with HMS Surprise. Um, Stephen, in contrast, is unshaved. He's unwashed. He's wearing some crappy old coat. He's got mismatched socks and a scrub wig. And it's a really great image of the sailors having taken the trouble to make themselves look beautiful. And Stephen, very unself aware, just showing up looking like he's wearing any old thing. And the men are very proud of their appearance. They hire some local children to help push off so that they don't get their beautiful uniforms dirty. And they're worried about this figure, the shabby figure of Dr. Maturin, perhaps falling in the water, which would require them to jump in and rescue him while they're all nicely turned out in their clean uniforms. Bonden goes so far as to suggest that it might be better for another boat to take Stephen to shore. Stephen informs him that he's going to the Irresistible and remarks, they receive me in this chaloupe, this embarkation, <laughs> like a dog in a game of Skittles, he muttered in a discontented tone. And it's great. Stephen has no idea why they're being so standoffish. He has no idea that his appearance is, you know, putting him beneath the dignity of the uh, the surprises barge crew. So he just about causes disgrace. He wavers slightly as he walks up the plank. He staggers and shrieks and Jack grabs hold of him, pinning his arms and gets him into the boat. So he talks about him being received like a dog in a game of Skittles. And Mike, I I think I know what Skittles are, but... This is a new thing for some of our readers, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was like a dog in a game of Skittles. I mean, in U.S., Skittles is like this this candy thing here, a dog in a game yeah. of Skittles. 
And and so I immediately, of course, went to the internet and I found a French stamp sort of illustrating huh. a dog in a game of Skittles. It's a dog with a bunch of bowling pins sort of knocked around on it. Um, and I noticed <laughs> a lot of, of kind of conversations on the internet from some number of years ago. I guess Tolskoy had used this expression in War and Peace and everybody's saying, dog in a game of Skittles? Is this from some old Russian thing? Where is this from? And everything. And apparently it's an English pub game, I guess, and also played in France, kind of an old bowling game. And you know, yep. certainly much better than I do. And and certainly with these sort of tall, skinny, uh, you know, wooden bowling pins, you don't want a dog walking through and knocking them all to pieces here. No, exactly right. Exactly right. And of course, Skittles predates the sort of sleek, 1950s Americana version of 10-pin bowling with, you know, lanes and ball retrieval and racks and all this kind of stuff. This is old school in the back of a pub. You know, Skittles is a game that you play the same time as you're playing darts or billiards or dominoes or something like that. I was thinking about all these, you know, these guys on the captain's barge decked out in their Senate hats. And I was trying to find out yeah. what exactly is a Senate hat. I, I, I found that I guess it was part of the naval uniform up until like the 1850s or so. Yeah, uh, later replaced it. So you've done a bit of research. I'm still looking to find great pictures. So I've got to click on some of your links here of what a Senate hat looks like, because I sure would love, you know, one of these broad brim, keep the sun out here in Florida. This would be great. And all the better with HMS Surprise embroidered on it. Uh, maybe, maybe even the lover's hole embroidered on it. <laughs> there you go. Merchandising opportunity. Yeah, Senate hat is a, a, a broad brim straw hat with a low crown. And I think they very often were tarred. And that might be the reason why oh. sailors are called tarpaulins or jack tars, because they wore these broad brim hats coated in tar to keep the spray off. Um, there's a picture of one at the uh, the Royal Maritime Museum, and we'll put that on our socials Brilliant. so we can see what a Senate hat looked like. Brilliant. I was chasing all over the Royal Maritime Museum website because I heard there was a reference to it yesterday, but I hadn't found it yet. So well done. Thank you. <laughs> ah, there you go. So they're back into naval business here, and Stephen meets Mr. Butcher. That's the butcher that we got to know in the previous book. He's the surgeon of the USS Norfolk. They're on the irresistible. Stephen wants to get his opinion on the post-operative recovery of the surgeon of the irresistible. This is this guy, Waters. And Butcher wonders why Stephen operated on the ship rather than at the hospital. And Stephen explains that his patient had fallen out with all the medical personnel at the hospital, and Butcher notes that although surgery can go better at the hospital, he's actually had better luck with recovery on board. And Waters, the recovering surgeon, congratulates Butcher on the Norfolk's trip home that's coming up on parole. Um, he worries about the look that he's seen on Butcher's face. And Stephen and Butcher obey, I think, the medical and surgical convention of talking about the bad news well out of earshot of the patient. They go up on deck and Butcher confirms to Stephen what I think Stephen must have suspected, which is that it's sepsis, it's blood poisoning that's affecting Waters. Says he doesn't know what turn it will take, noting that it might go better if there was a sudden triumph or some good news for the patient. And Mike, it, we've had this before from Stephen that he, in a very sort of holistic, philosophical way, combines physical and medical trauma with emotional and psychological trauma and sees them as all part of the same thing and having interactive cause and effect with each other. Butcher asks Stephen if he'll attempt any heroic remedies and Stephen says, I do not. It is a frail constitution there, much fretted with acrimony and discontent and domestic misfortune. And of course, Mike, none of those three things can have a prescription written for them, right? Right, right. And boy, I, I kind of paused here and went, uh-oh. So have we got somebody with a frail constitution or fretted with acrimony or discontent or domestic misfortune? And this is one of those, we keep calling them check off sort of things or a little foreshadowing. You know, our friends on Cinephile, I think, have a different term. Yeah, they call it plants and payoffs. Right. Uh, that's what Stephen John was saying. They call it, and this is a plant, right? We're having planted the idea that somebody can struggle to recover from a blow that is psychological and personal and emotional just or even more than they struggle to recover from uh, you know a medical or a surgical illness yeah it's funny i'm reminded of that old mark twain story about the guy you know sees his doctor and his doctor tells him he's got three months to live 
he doesn't want to die in three months. And he says, is there anything I can do? And, and Twain says, yeah, you got to give up drinking, smoking, and cussing. He said, well, I, I don't do any of those. The doctor said, well, then you've got three months. So we always have to hold something <laughs> back in reserve here. Keep keep some vices you can trade away for longer life later. But you know, Stephen's point is, is even more poignant here. Like you're saying there, yeah, that it's how we view life, how we react to what life brings us that influences our ability to bounce back, to recover physically, emotionally, mentally. And so, you know, we're going to have to be watching here. And this point gets punctuated because Butcher and Stephen then head off to see Captain Palmer. And we remember Palmer on the island, you know, really so down and his being so down affecting him so badly physically here. Wow. So, Mike, I, I think this might be time for a break. It might be time for our listeners to step away and examine their own circumstances. Uh, it might be also time to indulge in some drinking or some smoking or some cussing just to keep the wolf from the door. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's a good idea. Keep one of our vices in our back pockets for later use and trading in. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Well, welcome back. I hope everybody's had a little chance to examine their own circumstances and how they're dealing with what life brings them here. Jack is is doing a little bit of exactly that. He's now in the midst of this court-martial. And O'Brien writes, by this time, the court-martial had decided against the request of three of the prisoners to have their cases tried separately The charges against each had been read with all the necessary but wearisome legal repetition and the machine that would grind slowly on until they were hanged by the neck was now in full motion. Boy, you you talk about plants and payoff. I mean, we've got this this court martial literally just starting up and O'Brien's already telling us that regardless, it sounds like, of what happens, of what testimony is given, of what evidence is unearthed, that this has an end, that it is moving unstoppable force towards. And another thing that we're thinking, gosh, trials, trials. We've, we've already had an author's note about trials with this book, which we haven't gone into. We'll come back to later. But we know trials are going to play an important part. And here we have one. And it sounds like a little ominous. It really does. It's certainly ominous for the accused man. Yes. We learned that the Navy already had excellent physical descriptions of each of the mutineers from the Hermione. So there wasn't really a chance of mistaken identity. But despite this, each of them, as you might understand, really, each of them tried to hang on for a not guilty verdict and denied their guilt. They tried variously to lay the blame elsewhere, lay their blame on each other. There was a 16-year-old who said he was too young to hold out against the fury of 200 angry adults. And as Jack is listening to that, he thinks how the captain of the ship had turned the Hermione into a hell of float. And I think he's got some sympathy for the 16-year-old there. We learned that men had killed themselves trying to meet his demands only to be thrown overboard as lovers. And the surviving carpenter and gunner between them had said that no one had opposed the mutineers. But despite that, each of the accused asserted that they had tried to stop it. So with each of them pointing the finger at each other and against their former shipmates, there's no clear pattern that exonerates anybody. Everybody's really telling their their side of the story to save themselves. Right. So the evidence against the mutineers was overwhelming. Um, two men had been spared their lives in order to testify against the rest, which is a thing that I think Jack regards as really repugnant. It says that his spirits sank as he listened. The court was dead against them. And the case had been decided long before the sitting began. Stick a pin in that sentence. O'Brien describes the trial as an odious game with rules designed to make it have the outward appearance of being fair and impartial. But he says, there was something very deeply unpleasant in playing a part in this solemn farce, something horribly indecent about being in the judgment seat and watching the others in their hopeless struggle. Jack could not lay his hand on his heart and swear that in young Mitchell's place, he would have risked his life for the infamous Piggott. Piggott being the captain. Right. There were probably several men who had in fact 
been swept along in terrified neutrality, but it was utterly impossible to say who they were. And in any case, those who had turned the king's evidence swore that there was not one of the accused who had not taken up arms. How he wished he had knocked them all on the head in hot blood. And of course, he's thinking back to during the fight on the island with the, with the Norfolks. How he wished that his duty did not require him to sit there in his righteous squalor. And we get more and more of this, Mike, that, that one seaman turning on another. And this is another very telling thing for Jack that we might have to think about later. Jack had seen the strong mutual loyalty of seamen break down before now. He had seen men in overcrowded boats pulling away from a sinking ship, thrusting their swimming shipmates back and even cut off their fingers as they clung to the gunwale. This was much the same kind of spectacle. Wow. And Mike, as you said, there's, there are some plants and payoffs here. There's this foreshadowing about a trial, as we say. And I, I had forgotten all about this until I read it again just now for the show. There's this foreshadowing of the possibility that under the pressure of a trial, naval loyalty, that the family ties between members of a ship's company can break down. And I think we're going to have cause to dread that particular turn of events later on in the book as well. So Jack's in the midst of this. He's not happy. And, and as they meet back on deck at the end of the day, Stephen's not happy either. Captain Palmer, who had at first seemed to respond to Stephen's prescription, had gone back downhill. Butcher goes so far to say that Palmer would cut his own throat if he wasn't being watched. And, and Stephen's kind of at his wit's end a little bit. Laudanum is no longer answering. And Stephen wishes he had cocoa leaves to try. So <laughs> Stephen is certainly reaching oh. deep into his attic's bag of tricks to try, to try to pull Palmer out the way he's pulled himself out sometimes in the past here. And Jack and Stephen, they return to the ship. And Jack invites Stephen to dinner. But neither of them has much of an appetite, even though they ask Killick and, and Jack's cook to get something together really quickly. And he gets this phenomenal fish soup, which sounds wonderful in the book. Um, neither Jack or Stephen eat much of it. And Jack had asked the Admiral about the Admiralty at Stephen's behest. And, and he's now reporting back to Stephen, telling him that Mr. Barrow is still the acting second secretary, but that as before... Ray is still doing Barrow's work for him. And O'Brien takes his time out to kind of remind us all about Stephen and Ray's history, how the top French spy that Stephen had identified back in Malta, Ray had allowed to escape. And, and Stephen's thinking perhaps it was due to Ray's lack of intelligence experience. But Stephen still, he, he really wants to talk to Ray. He wants to learn what happened in Malta after Stephen left, you know, with Laura Fielding and they shelled for Gibraltar. And he's glad that he doesn't have to get that story secondhand from Mr. Barrow, who was not there and really doesn't know what's going on. But but we know, and, and O'Brien also tells us, that Stephen really wants to talk to Ray because he wants to learn more about the letter that Stephen sent along with Ray to give to Diana and Stephen had really hoped that Ray could do some explaining uh, that would go along with the letter and the other letters he'd written Diana that would make everything okay again. Stephen also is looking forward to collecting all this money that Ray owes him for uh, playing cards so badly with him. And he wants to find out if Ray has kind of come through further. He's, you know, Ray had promised he would try to help Pullings, and, and indeed he's gotten Pullings in command. He'd also promised that he would help Jack get a heavy frigate on the North American station. Now, Stephen <laughs> wonders whether Ray will come through with that or not, but he wants to find out. And then O'Brien reminds us as readers again what we know that Stephen does not. Absolutely. And this is one of those literary tricks that O'Brien has kept running for many books now. We know stuff about the situation that Stephen doesn't. And it leaves us kind of sometimes shouting at the page going, you know, look out behind you. Right. O'Brien writes, simplicity was not perhaps one of Stephen's most outstanding characteristics, yet his mind was not wholly free of it. And he had never suspected the possibility of Ray's being a French agent. Nor, it must be confessed, had the even less simple Sir Joseph, whose only objection to Ray was his unsuitability, his inexperience, and his want of discretion. Neither Stephen nor Sir Joseph could conceive the possibility of any French intelligence organisation recruiting an expensive, gambling, fashionable, unreliable, loquacious rake, however sharp and clever. 
nor did either of them conceive that Ray and his more intelligent and powerful but less showy friend Ledwood, also a besotted admirer of Bonaparte, were in fact behind the obscure movement in Whitehall that was tending to discredit Sir Joseph and his allies and to displace him in favour of the comparative non-entity Barrow, who could easily be manipulated even if he did return to effective office, a movement that would, if it were successful, give Ray and Ledwood access to that curious body so rarefied as to be almost ghostly, known simply as the Committee, which took cognizance at the highest level of the activities of all the various British and Allied intelligence services. And again, we've got this very deliberate rejuvenation, I think, of the Ray and Ledwood story. And Mike, over the last two or three books, we haven't heard very much from Jack Yellow or Mrs. Broad or Mrs. Williams or Heripath or Duhamel or, or lots of the other secondary characters who are geographically far away. But we do keep being given a little fresh boost of the intrigue about Ray and Ledwood. And it really raises the question, how long is O'Brien going to string this out? How much longer is Stephen going to continue in ignorance of their treachery? And how much longer are we going to have to suffer in silence? Right. Right. Hmm. I'm, I'm reminded of, you know, hollering at the screen in those horror movies going, you know, don't go downstairs. Don't go in the basement, <laughs> like you say. And it's like, oh, my gosh. And we've already heard, you know, in the beginning of this book, how things have not gone well in the war, partially because... The French always seem to know, you know. It's like they've got somebody under the table or standing behind the door, and and we know who it is, and we want Stephen to you know, and 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 Sir Joseph to do something about it. Ah, but so yeah. we've got this. You know, we're reminded here, and in the meantime, as Stephen and Jack are sitting there, another boat hails the surprise, and there's something mentioned about a letter. And of course, both Jack and Stephen are very anxious to hear from the women they love. Jack to learn about Sophie's reaction to Sam, Stephen to learn about Diana's reaction to Ray and to Stephen's letters. And so they quickly kill it, get up, uh, you know, get upstairs, find out if there's any mail. And it turns out that there's only one letter, one letter that had been written from Poolings to mow it. And this ship, the Swedes who were going to be picking up the Americans and taking them home on parole had, had passed Poolings and had delivered this letter to mow it. So, uh, Jack invites Moet to come have coffee with him and I guess share what he's learned from this letter. And it turns out that Poolings has arranged for a book of Moet's poetry to be published. And Moet is, of course, over the top delighted here. Uh, Moet reports that he only has to pay the cost of printing, pay for advertising, pay a small fee for all of that being managed, and he gets to keep half the profits if it sells. <laughs> so, plus, not only does he have this great deal, but the publisher has the first rights to any of Moet's future works on the same terms, and Moet is delighted. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, Ian, but I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, this sounds like a really bad deal. And you reminded me that this comes at, at a fascinating time in, in our author, Patrick O'Brien's life here. Right. So he was writing this book I, at a time when he was still feeling pretty ticked off that his original U.S. publisher had dropped him. Right. Um, so we're, we're still in the time before O'Brien was really, really taking off with the American audience when he was really relying on British readership. Certainly known to run roughshod over a new author and and really take all the deal for themselves. I can can just see, a, you know, kind of a picture of the Three Stooges. This is a very old, yeah. <laughs> you know, with two fingers poking somebody in the eye and maybe O'Brien feeling a bit like that <laughs> on the receiving oh, end good. of those fingers here. But Boich telling them all about these details about his publishing, and Jack and Stephen are kind of like, well, I, I don't understand all these terms. I think they understand the, the business terms, but there's a lot of publishing terms that come up. So they turn, they, they, they try to get some help here. Yeah, they turn to Nathaniel Martin, who we haven't heard of for a few chapters, but it's great that he's still around. He had been in the publishing business when he didn't have a parish and a church to think about in his role as a priest. And Martin hears these terms like Pika and Royal Octavo, and he thinks this publisher has what he calls a pronounced resemblance to Barabbas, who, of course, is the uh, the thief who was let go by Pontius Pilate, um, or Boabbas, as he's known to Monty Python fans. Right. Anyway, they, they don't tell Moat about this because they don't want to burst his bubble, right? He, this, this publishing deal that he's got is a bit of a lemon. 
Martin graciously joins in the celebration. He's quite happy to sort of wave off his, making his, his points about this grasping publisher. And he explains the publishing terms. And meanwhile, they get into talking about the latest service gossip. And Moat tells them that Pullings had, uh, had been chased by a privateer when he took the Danae home. He had only escaped when the privateer split her foresail. And Jack weighs in and says that this privateer ship must have been the Spartan. And the Spartan is a French-American joint venture specialising in harassing West Indies merchantmen. And by the way, we still think that she's got a good reason to want to pursue the Danae because that brass chest might still be on board with all the, the money that they had recovered in the uh, in the previous book. The Spartan had been disguised of a Portuguese man of war and had almost fooled Tom. And they get into this conversation about privateers. Martin says, well, what, what is a privateer? Is he not the same as a man of war? And Jack and Moat insist that a privateer and a man of war are very different. Stephen says, you are to consider, my dear sir, that the privateer is primarily concerned with gain. He lives on captured merchantmen, whereas the gentlemen of the Royal Navy live chiefly on glory and fairly scorn a prize. So, this is another little bit of roasting from Stephen. They all have a good laugh, although Stephen and Martin laugh more. And Jack argues that they go after enemy ships first, not merchantmen. He's upholding the honour of the Royal Navy. Uh, he says, though, that some privateers overstep the bounds and become pirates. And he sees a big distinction between the honour of the Royal Navy and the tawdry commercial doings of pirates. Stephen notes, nonetheless, that there are 50,000 of these privateers men and martin says that's one third of the strength of the british navy and its marines so there's a lot of people involved in this occupation in this pursuit jack says that not all privateers are the same some are manned by a good crew captained by british navy officers who are on the beach some of whom are friends of jack's and Mowat suddenly remembers amidst, amidst all of this that he was supposed to ask jack to join the gun room for dinner the next day and Jack says, well, I'd like to, but I have this court-martial coming up. Remember, this court-martial hasn't finished yet. We've heard the evidence. It's been very distressing, but we haven't had the conclusion and we haven't had the verdict. So Jack says, well, maybe I'll be able to come and join you for pudding. So we might have to come back again, Mike. We, we had all sorts of long-term bits of story uh, content given a little spin here. And we've had another spin to this, this idea about privateering and the fact that Jack insists that despite the fact that some of them are kind of honourable, it's still beneath the dignity of most Navy officers to take up with the privateering trade. Yes, we, we may have to come back to that. What, what do we say? Stick a pin in yeah. this, right? Yeah. yeah. And as Jack predicts the next day, the court-martial does run long. Ghoul, Captain Ghoul, we remember him. Uh, he's kind of heading up all the set of captains that are there. And he tells them that the Admiral would like them to finish the next day, Saturday, so that they can have all the hangings of the following day. So before we've ever gotten to a guilty verdict, we're already planning when the hanging is going to be. And mm. the new young captain, one of the guys on the court, it has just been made captain. He's appalled by this idea of Sunday hangings. And we suspect that other people are, but they don't seem to react as visibly here. Uh, but the yeah. Gould's argument, the Admiral really wants this trial and the punishment to stand out because of the heinousness of these deserters here. Stephen, as kind of like the day before, Jack's leaving this. We've got the hanging. Stephen has now seen waters again, and he's delirious. So he's not in a good place. When the Admiral's secretary, Mr. Stone, who we remember was kind of a, wanted to get more involved in intelligence, approaches Stephen. And he tells Stephen confidentially that one of Stone's informants has provided some information that might be of interest to Captain Aubrey. The Spartan, that privateer that chased Pullings, has sailed from New Bedford, he learned, five days ago, with supplies for a three month cruise. And he says this with a very knowing look. You know, he's, you can kind of see him kind of into Stephen, this simpatico, you know, you and I were both involved in intelligence. We could talk some more on the subject here. And I love O'Brien writes, Stephen repelled the advance with the impenetrable reserve and stupidity. 
And he was certain that Stone would never take such a foolish and improper liberty with him again. I think Stephen can't believe this guy's approaching him on the deck of a ship in public with intelligence matters. But, O'Brien writes, that Stephen was equally certain that his double character was known or at least suspected in places where he had thought himself safe, and that with each fresh spread of this knowledge, his usefulness and his safety diminish. So, you know, another plant, another little ominous foreshadowing here, another kind of ratchet up the tension. You can kind of hear the background score of this movie kind of turning a little bit more dark and dangerous here, right? It's funny, isn't it? Back in Master and Commander and Post Captain, you know, news of a prize would have made us think, ah, oh, well, Jack is going to you know, slip his cable and sail out in the dead of night and take the prize. But now our first thought is, well, what does this mean? What does this mean for Stephen's cover being blown? What does this mean for the state of intelligence? Right. So a- along with our characters, I think we're, we, we've gained a higher level of perception about what's really going on here nice. from where the danger really lies. So Jack and Stephen do get to join the gun room in the end for this dinner that's honoring the American officers before they head home on parole. Butcher, the American surgeon, is the guest of honor. And another midshipman is there, another American midshipman, along with the surprises officers. And Mike, I can remember there being a red-headed American midshipman who was kind of helpful right at the end of Far Side of the World. And I wonder if it's the same fellow. Yeah, I suspect so. Anyhow, Moat tells Jack as he gets in that they've been keeping the pudding back for him. It's his favorite spotted dog now they've been trying while they were waiting to solve some of butcher's riddles and whatever his other strengths butcher is not blessed with a very subtle sense of humor the current riddle that they're working on is what is never out of fashion and people are trying all different ways and they can't get the answer and in the end butcher says you'll never guess it although yours is quite a manly service what is never out of fashion is the getting of bastards ha 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 and in the split second before he began his laugh, rather heartier than the occasion required, Jack saw the eyes of all his officers instantly turn upon him. They expressed concern and support. And I, I think we get now that Jack was willing to laugh along. It says, all hands followed his lead with a violence that gratified Butcher and astonished the tall American midshipman who had been exposed to the surgeon's riddles for 10,000 miles and had thought them sad stuff, even at the first hearing. Wow. Wow. So good, good old Jack is willing to join in with a laugh at himself, despite the fact that this, this I think it was an ignorant thing. Right. I don't think right. it was a, a fling, but he could really have taken offense. Definitely. Definitely. Well, thankfully, they're saved from the next riddle and, and where this thing might have gone because the pudding arrives. And, and yeah. it's fascinating. I mean, we still kind of get these little insights into Jack, and, and we know Jack's character so well already. And even though this is at least one of Jack's favorite puddings, as we've said before, you know, in different books, it seems like his favorite pudding changes from time to time. But yeah. it's his favorite. It's the first suet pudding he's had in some time, you know, since Capricorn there. And But Jack says he, in his own mind, would have given five pounds to be able just to kind of slip it into his handkerchief and put it in his pocket. He really doesn't have any appetite after the court-martial, but he knows that Moet is watching, that the gunroom steward who had supervised the cooking is watching, and they're all going to take great delight in Jack really loving this pudding. So he kind of chokes it down. Ah, oh. it's, it's funny. It reminded me of the contrast with the scene in the movie, The Far Side of the World, the Master and Commander movie, where, where Jack, rather unbelievably, I thought, kind of scoops up uh, a piece of the floating Galapagos pudding and kind of shovels it down. This is this is completely the opposite side of Jack. He's so disturbed by the conduct of this court martial and by his role in it that he can't even manage his favorite pudding. It's a really glum moment, but. Custom at mealtime demands that just like Jack chokes down his pudding, they all get on with the next stage of the entertainment, which is toasts and more drinking. Right. And they deliver the traditional Navy toast of wives and sweethearts and the murmured reply, may they never meet, which has a bit of added poignancy now, given all that's going on in everybody's lives. Uh, Plus the fact that they're all a long way from home. It, It says Jack, for example, had drunk nothing at all. And yet he was so moved 
by a sudden diamond-sharp vision of his home, by this vision coming on top of his horrible day, and by the thoughts that crowded into his head, that the only way he could think of to do his convivial duty by the gunroom and its guests was to drink to them, each in turn. And of course, drinking to them doesn't mean a little sip. This means a glass of wine with you, sir, and bottoms up. Jack's toasts went around the table. One was delivered up to the officer of the watch and ended up with Stephen, who replied, Your very good health, sir, and may no new thing arise. God send us luck on our voyage. And it was clear from Stephen's tone that he thought luck would be needed. And this might have cast a chill on the party had not the marine officer chosen the same moment for gliding under the table a smooth plunge into smiling, speechless coma. Wow. Here's this thing. It's fascinating. You know, we've got, this is in theory, what we believe to be the last voyage of the surprise, the last leg on to home. And I guess this crew thinking we're about to be broken up. They've been away for years. This wives and sweethearts, even though we hear the little murmur, it just so deeply affects them. And we know Stephen and Jack are certainly thinking a lot about wives, as, as we talked about here. And, and back in the cabin, they're preparing to play some music. They're going to meet up with the Admiral, play some more music here. But before they do, Jack tells Stephen that it, it's really not true that wine changes your mood. As you just said, he had junk a full glass of wine with everybody in that dinner and had drunk one and sent one upstairs to the officer on the watch. So, you know, many, many glasses of wine later, you know, he says that he's still as melancholy as a jib cat and as sober as a judge. And just so that we understand how melancholy that is, Ian, tell us what a, a jib cat is again. Well, it's funny. I'd always supposed that a jib cat was a cat from Gibraltar. Um, but a jib cat is a castrated male cat. And castrated male cats generally not happy with their life. So there's our interesting choice of simile, I think, for Patrick O'Brien at this stage. Right. As melancholy as a castrated male cat. Absolutely. Hmm. And, and, you know, knowing my castrated male cat, that could be very melancholy at times, especially <laughs> at certain times of the year. Right. Well, and, and Jack gives us an example to Stephen. For example, even though he's had all this much to drink, he is not even the least bit tempted to ruin his career to, by telling the Admiral what he thinks about his Sunday hangings. And we certainly know that a younger Jack in his cups may well have done yeah. exactly that. And Stephen takes this sober moment to go ahead and deliver Stone's earlier message about the Spartan sailing. So here they got Stephen, Jack alone, and Jack's, you know, hearing about the Spartan now being on this three-month cruise. And he says, sailed, the devil she has, says Jack, a dark gleam coming over his face. Then I may be able to cook two geese with one. Well, <laughs> we're launching into an Aubreyism. <laughs> Jack cashes himself and says, I may be able to get out of this damnable hanging and have a chance of nobbling the privateer. Kill it, kill it there. Pass the word from Mr. Mowat. Mr. Mowat, there is a possibility that we may be able to sail away on tomorrow's tide rather than wait until next week. The ship is ready to sail, I believe. And so here we go. <sighs> Boom. We're starting to move into action here. Yeah. The, we run the risk here of saying there's not a moment to lose. Right. <laughs> right. Jack gives strict orders to get everything ready. And Mike, I was really relieved. I mean, I really enjoyed this chapter, but all the twists and the turns and the human drama and the melancholy, it's really great to feel that Jack's pull starts to race with the prospect of some action at sea. Right. He gives strict orders to be sure that everything will be ready including having enough sober crew members and no women aboard to sail at the evening tide after the end of this horrible court-martial. And later, as Jack and Stephen are playing with the Admiral, the Admiral says how happy he would be if the court-martial indeed finished tomorrow. And Jack mentions to the Admiral this privateer, the Spartan, and his desire to sail the next evening. And of course, we've heard already that for this particular Admiral, any, any price taken by Jack is a win. So the Admiral would very much like to have the Spartan taken, sunk, burned, or destroyed, but has never been able to spare two ships at the same time to go after her. He reminds Jack that the Tartan fires 42-pound balls and warns Jack that he may have, in his phrase, caught a Tartar if he comes upon her. The Admiral 
remembers his manners and apologizes to Stephen for this shop talk, and they go back to playing their Dissersdorf. So waiting in the morning to sail over to the flagship, Jack orders Moat to pick up some materials to help disguise the surprise. And again, Mike, this is a nice harking back to all of the chases and ruses de guerre of, of Jack in previous books. The end of the court-martial is, in fact, just as horrible as Jack had thought it would be. The young captain who's part of the court-martial uh, panel has some trouble with it, but Ghoul and Stone direct him to the inevitable end as each of the captains finds every prisoner guilty and they're sentenced to death. By the time they had to sign the final paper after each individual's punishment had been read out, even Ghoul did not relish it. And this is the same Ghoul who we don't have a high opinion of from earlier in the book. And the court-martial flag was lowered on the flagship. Jack saw the surprise, preparing to get underway. He met Stephen, whose face is also grave and heavy, as he lists the last prescription. I think it's the last prescription that we hear about for Waters. And Mike, I have a horrible feeling it's the last prescription, meaning the last prescription for this poor guy, Waters, with the sepsis. And he comes aboard the surprise, and we're back into naval action. Jack says, Mr. Mowat, to the flag, request permission to part company. And there we are, end of chapter two, parting company, sailing out of Barbados, going after the Spartan. Whoa. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice, Mike, to have just one more victory for the surprise on this, what's probably the last leg of her final voyage? Wouldn't it, though? Yeah. And so we, we've got that, and I love that. And then I'm still kind of wondering, like you said, all these things that we've had hanging, hanging, hanging for a while, Sophie and Diana this intelligence coup that's happening in Whitehall, this Stephen having been realizing he's more and more compromised here. Yeah. What's going to happen to our heroes then? How, how are they going to react to all these situations? Are we going to discover that our heroes are like Waters and Palmer? Or are they going to write a different story for themselves? Well, There's still a good bit of ocean, I think, between the surprise and home and a resolution of all these uh, all these different threads in the story. There is, Ian. There is a good bit of ocean, and I can't wait to be in it and amongst it. What do you say next week to pulling down Chapter 3 of Reverse of the Metal and a little bit more, Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. and a father of the church can have an irregular connection, why, that is a comfort to a man. So it is too, although I believe he was not a practicing saint at the time. Excellent joke.